Hey, hello there. Grab your Bibles. We're starting a new book. We're in the 12. We've been looking at the Minor Prophets for a few weeks here, 16 weeks to be exact. And now we're in week 17. We're going to start looking at the book of Nahum, which is very cool. And it's the, the first book past the halfway point in the 12. We studied already about how Micah was the halfway point. And at Micah 312, we had this finishing of, of wrath, and then we had a beginning of the the mountain of the Lord, the nation of the Lord being built up, his kingdom in Micah, which is very exciting. And now as we're getting into Nahum, we're going to see some really cool things and kind of a sequel to Jonah, which we did a few weeks ago. So that's going to be fun. But uh, just a, a quick review of, of where we've been. There's These are the 12. We are studying them as a unit. We're studying them from a kind of a satellite view, getting a big picture. We're not going really intricately verse by verse. We're going to get the whole thought of the books as we go and then also see the unity of the 12 kind of as a, a particular presentation by God of all 12 of these together. So that's where we're at. We're going to be starting Nahum today. So get your Bibles and, and be ready. But let's go ahead and, and open up in prayer. Lord, we come before you. Thank you so much for your word. Thank you for your truth that we can learn from it, that we can live by it. Lord, as we look into your book of Nahum, Please teach us, help us to understand what's going on there, help us to understand how that applies to our lives and how we should live it out and bring others to it and, Lord, live closer to you because we've studied this book of Nahum. Lord, we thank you for it again and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so let's go ahead and get right into it. Um, go ahead and open your Bibles or read along with me on the screen here. And we're gonna, we are gonna look at, at every verse in Nahum chapter one today. But the book of Nahum really is an amazing book, the way it's written. It's got poetry in it. The entire book looks like it, it has a chiastic poetic structure that focuses kind of on this. Some call it a lament over Assyria in the middle, you know, in chapter 2. And I, it can also be considered a taunt over Assyria. And it has to do with lions. So think about that as you read through Nahum over this next week. Because we're not going to get to the lions this week, but we'll get to them next week. And we've even got some pictures of lions from ancient Nineveh that we're going to be able to look at, and we're going to see some things about that next week. So that's going to be very cool. So be thinking about that. But let's go ahead and just see how does this book start. The Oracle of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkishite. So that's really all we, that's the only time Nahum is mentioned in all of the scriptures is right there. There's other places where we can speculate, yeah, maybe this prophet that they're talking about was Nahum, but this is kind of it. And right here is like the last time we talk about Nineveh specifically in this chapter by name, which is interesting. So this is an oracle of Nineveh and the book of Nahum really was written to Judah more than it was to Nineveh or to Assyria. In fact, the Assyrians may never have seen this. They had their opportunity to repent when Jonah came to them, and they did repent at that time, but then they fell away from the Lord again. And the Lord allowed that to happen so that he could bring punishment upon Judah, who had also turned away from him. And we're going to see, you know, when we're talking about Nineveh, is it really that same Nineveh that Jonah was talking to, yes, it is that same Nineveh just a hundred years later. It's not even that much further into the future from the time when Jonah spoke to the Ninevites. So this, and, and I think we've seen in our own country several times over the last hundred years, how quickly things can move back and forth and how public opinion, government control, all of these different things can change drastically. And that's, you know, so seeing that happen with a big, powerful country like Assyria uh, in ancient times certainly is no surprise. So when was it written? Well, we have some clues from history and from Nahum. Nahum in chapter three speaks of the conquest of No Ammon, which is Thebes. And that we know um, 
happened in 663 BC. And then Nineveh, as Nahum had proclaimed, was utterly destroyed and fell in 612 BC, never to be inhabited again. Um, the only inhabitants there now are archaeologists who are going through digs and grabbing up all of the, the cool things that they could find there. Interestingly enough, very little of, of monetary value at that time that it was plundered. All the gold and all the silver were carried out at that time and all of the, the fancy stuff. The only thing left behind was documents and, and these, these stone writings that we call Stella that have been very valuable to us from a historical standpoint, but uh, it's, but they were left because they couldn't be sold or, or bartered or, or uh, taken to the pawn shop back then. So we're, we believe that about 650 years B.C. is the best date for the book of Nahum. So what has happened since Jonah 100 years earlier? Well, if we go to Second Chronicles chapter 33, we find out a lot about some things that were happening. One, Manasseh, we know Manasseh from, uh, he's this evil king. He took power when he was 12 years old. He reigned in, in um, Jerusalem for a long time, but he did evil in the, in the sight of the Lord according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had dispossessed before the sons of Israel. Remember, Israel was sent into the promised land because those that were there had defiled the land. And so Israel went in to bring righteousness back to the land, and then they failed to do so in many instances. And Manasseh was a, a glaring example of that. So what happened to Manasseh? God sent the Assyrians in to get him. Okay, so Manasseh misled the people of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to do more evil than the nations whom the Lord destroyed before the sons of Israel. The Lord spoke to Manasseh and his people. Okay, so he sent prophets to the to the nation of Judah, but they paid no attention. They didn't listen. They didn't care. They wanted to go their own way. Therefore, the Lord brought the commanders of the army of the king of Assyria against them, and they captured Manasseh with hooks. They bound him with bronze chains and took him to Babylon. So here King Manasseh, Judah was overrun by Assyria, sent from God to punish Judah for turning away from him and then for not paying any attention or ignoring him when he sent the prophets to ask them to repent, even as he had asked Jonah to go to uh, Nineveh, to Assyria, a hundred years earlier. And so because of that, Manasseh was taken captive. And it's very interesting that that the what we see here is a lot of biblical history and other history, historic accounts, that really we have so much information from this era that, you know, we have an embarrassment of riches, really, to understand what was going on at that time. And so, like, if you look at this, the Assyria captured Manasseh with hooks. This is called the steel of Ershaddon, and Ershaddon was a king of Assyria. And here, look how big they've made him when they made it. This is, they found this, um, I think, in the palace of Sennacherib in Nineveh. This is one of the, the ruins from there, but look how big they made Ershad and the king of Assyria, and look how small they made is these are not these are not children, these are enemy kings. This is the king of Egypt at the time. And this could be an Egyptian or an Ethiopian. Some actually even think that this might be Manasseh himself. They look at this cap and they see some other ruins from Assyria that show a, a lid like that on top of uh, King Jehu. But look really closely here. See, he's got this scepter in his hand. And if you look real close, and you can look it up on the internet, you know, look for the Ershadon uh, um, victory Stella. And, and Ershadon, I don't know that I'm pronouncing that anywhere near S.R. Haddon. I, I don't know how, I don't know how to pronounce that. So, uh, but that's how it's spelled. And if you look that up, then you can get a big picture of this. Or if you're looking on a big screen, you can see it. But you can see these strings coming down, these cords coming down from his hand to hooks in the noses of the kings that he's captured here. Okay. And so when we see that, that Second Chronicles tells us that the king of Assyria captured Manasseh with hooks and bound him with bronze chains and took him back to Babylon. Uh, and then we see this 
this picture here, it kind of brings things into focus that, okay, the, we were seeing the same accounts from two different sides, from two different historians. And, you know, one thing that we'll notice, though, in the biblical accounts versus the secular accounts, whoever's writing the history in these secular accounts tends to forget about his defeats and always remembers his victories. So whenever we found one, it's something like this, where you've got this king being huge and keeping the other kings in captivity and hooks and things like that. But our Lord has his prophets keep a a better account or a, or a more accurate account. And so when Manasseh is taken away in hooks, it's recorded there. Uh, but when when Ashurbanipal is defeated, that's not recorded. Or when Ershadon is suffers defeat, those aren't recorded. Anything like that. So that's kind of interesting there. So this is you know this is a pretty nasty thing for Manasseh to have to suffer, and he does he does respond to it. Um, and I'm not sure. I must have missed that because I thought I put that in the slides here. Uh, but because of this. If you keep reading in 2 Chronicles chapter 33, you'll see that Manasseh repented and he recognized the Lord his God. And that's that's a powerful thing. And so this, this capture of Assyria, or capture of, of Manasseh by Assyria, finally got the point across to Manasseh and to Judah, even when God's own prophets couldn't do that. So, and then it wasn't just Judah, but Assyria made conquests of Egypt and Ethiopia and other places. This big stone uh, pictograph that you see here, this is the conquest of Thebes or Lo Ammon that we talked about before in Ethiopia. And these are all of the captives being led out. And again, this is a, a big piece of stone that we found in Sennacherib's palace in Nineveh. So... What about this poem of God's greatness then? This is really cool. Nahum chapter 1 verses 2 through 8 is a, an acrostic poem. And it, it has the first half of the Hebrew alphabet, Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, as it goes down through. Um, and it has the first half of it, with the exception of verse 3 in there. Verse 3 is, you know, the the uh, part where the Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and the Lord will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. And that's its tie to Micah. We talked about how the 12 have this unified structure, and they, the reason that they're put in the the order that they're put in is because God's revealing himself to us in a special way. And so this is the tie that we see. We see these ties to each book. And the tie from Micah to Nahum is that this last poem in Micah, in Micah chapter 7, matches this part of this poem in Nahum chapter 1. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, which is a quote from Exodus chapter 34. And the that part of this poem is not part of the acrostic. You've got the Aleph before it, and then this doesn't really have a, you know, it doesn't correspond to that. And then you've got the Bet, the second letter in the, the Hebrew alphabet, after it. And so it's kind of stands out. It's kind of set apart. And so that's the tie that you see from one book to the next. But so this this is a promise that this an oracle of Nineveh, right? From chapter or from verse one that we already read. Remember that? But then the bulk of the chapter is this poem, this acrostic poem about the greatness of God. And and what this is what this is doing is setting up Nineveh to understand who they're dealing with. So Nineveh, this is an oracle about you. Judah, this is an oracle about Nineveh. First of all, let's see who Nineveh is going to have to deal with. Let's see who anybody's going to have to deal with because everybody has to deal with God. So we're going to make this acrostic poem so that it really stands out and really hits home. And then we are going to talk about dealing with Nineveh and rescuing Judah. So let's do that. A jealous and avenging God is the Lord. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. 
The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries. He reserves wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. The Lord will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. In whirlwind and storm is his way, and clouds are the dust beneath his feet. He rebukes the sea and he makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither. The blossoms of Lebanon wither. Mountains quake because of him, and the hills dissolve. Indeed, the earth is upheaved by his presence, the world and all who inhabit it. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the burning of his anger? His wrath is poured out like the fire, and the rocks are broken up by him. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who take refuge in him. But with an overflowing flood, he will make a complete end of its sight, and it will, and he will pursue his enemies into darkness. And so we see this, this picture of the Lord being dominant over all the people, over all of the parts of the earth, the ocean, the mountains, the skies, the, the valleys, the hills, everything is underneath the control of God, and it is within his power to destroy them or to build them up. And by the the on the flip side of that coin, that the Lord is the one who is the stronghold in a time of trouble. When there is trouble in our lives, then he is the place where we can come for refuge that nothing else can touch and nothing else can destroy. He can make a, a complete end of, with a great flood. He can shake the mountains, but nothing can shake him. And that's our God. The Lord is good. And that's why his power doesn't terrify those who who come to him, who love him. But to his enemies, to his adversaries, this is truly a terrifying thing. So what is the result of going against God's greatness? And we see this, this, what, this you in verses 9, and then we'll see it again in 11. And there's a lot of confusion. What's being talked about here? Is this, are we talking to Judah? Are we talking to Nineveh? Or is this the royal you? Is this like, you know, whoever? And near as I can tell from reading this, and it makes the most sense to me, that just following that poem is setting up the royal you. Like for 9 and 10, that we're looking at, this is for everybody. Whatever anyone devises against the Lord, he will make a complete end of it. Distress will not rise up twice. It just happens once and then he deals with it. Uh, tangled thorns and those who are drunken with their drink, they are consumed as stubble, completely withered. And so I think that, that as we look at the greatness of God in those first eight verses, then we see that no one can devise anything against him. And then we enter into verse 11, and we, we now I think we're targeting specifically back against Nineveh. From you has gone forth one who has plotted evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor. And some believe this to be Sennacherib. Some believe this to be Ershaddon that we talked about earlier. Some think maybe it's Ashurbanipal II. Could be any of these guys, any of these lines of, of the kings, any in, the, in this line of the kings of Assyria, could this could be speaking of. Um, because all of them did that, okay? So we have accounts of that, of Sennacherib going up against Israel when Hezekiah was king. Hezekiah put his hands on the altar and he prayed to the Lord, and the, and the Lord took Sennacherib out and sent him packing back home. So, you know, it could be any of those guys, but God is pointing out to Nineveh, you are guilty. Okay, here here I am, the one that you have to deal with, and here's my character, and here's my power. And now if anyone tries to stand up against the Lord, that's going to go badly for them. And here you have decided to stand up against the Lord. And to Judah then, he is saying, don't worry about these Assyrians that are taking you away in hooks and that are invading your land and doing these things, I'm going to take care of them and I'm going to take care of you in a very different way, in a loving way. Thus says the Lord, though they are at full strength and likewise many, even so they're going to be cut off and pass away. Though I have afflicted you, Judah, I will afflict you no longer. 
Now I will break his yoke bar from upon you, and you will tear off the sh and I'll tear off your shackles. Okay, the shackles that Assyria Assyria has placed on you, Judah. I'm going to tear them off. And the, the Lord has a command concerning you, Assyria. Your name will no longer be perpetuated. I will cut off the idol in the image from the house of your gods, and I will prepare your grave, for you are contemptible. This is good news to Judah. Behold, on the mountain. The feet of him who brings good news, who announces peace. Celebrate your feasts, O Judah. Pay your vows, for never again will the wicked one pass through you. He is completely cut off. And so in chapter 1 here, then, we do. We have this presentation. This is an oracle of Nineveh. Nineveh may never hear it. Okay, but Judah is definitely hearing it and recognizing the power of their great God, the love for those who are his, the strength that he has in dealing with his enemies and his adversaries and the adversaries of his people and the, the destruction that will come upon any that oppose him, the presentation of the guilt of Assyria opposing him, and then showing the reversal of fortune to Judah, that as you were shackled, you're going to be freed. And as Assyria shackled you, they will be shackled. They will be eliminated. That's what's going on to introduce this. Now, the next two chapters, we're going to look at this invasion that God sends against Assyria. And then the, the lament or taunt over Assyria. And then the plunder uh, as as the invaders leave and take everything with them. It's pretty fascinating, but go ahead and read through it. Look at the lions. I promise pictures of lions next week. Um, but for this week, remember the Lord is slow to anger and great in power, but he will no, by no means leave the guilty unpunished. If we see him being slow in his anger, that's because of his great character. And we understand that he's slow to be angry with us as well as with our enemies, but we recognize that those who come to him, he cherishes and he upholds and he is a stronghold for us. So remember that this week, be reading in your Bibles, take a look at Nahum, get the most of it, and we will see you next week. God bless you.